There is a lot wrong with diets that are based on starvation or telling you you can't eat healthy complex carbs and things like that. And there's a lot of goofy diets out there. But a diet based on healthy vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans is the fuel your body works on. And that allows you to succeed automatically. And that heals you f physically. But it also allows you to repair some of the damage that happens to us in years of commercial diet goofy nonsense that we've had to live with, okay? Well, thank you, Gina. Thank you, Jerry. It's, it's a delight to be here. Uh, what a wonderful place. Um, I didn't grow up in such a wonderful place. I have to tell you, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, anybody been there? Seen the movie? Okay, that's my mom in that movie. A anyway, um, my, uh, my father uh, grew up in the cattle business. And his father and his father and his father, they were all cattle ranchers. And, and uh, my dad didn't like the cattle business, and so he left. And he went to medical school. And he came back, and he became the diabetes expert for Fargo and all of North Dakota and Western Minnesota. And I never once heard him say that anyone got better. What they did is they managed their disease. Diabetes was a one-way street. It was a progressive disease, and our goal was to try to manage it and to, 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 to do the best that you could. And when he was in his uh, late 60s, early 70s, he started to succumb to symptoms that we had never seen in him before. And his mind was starting to go a little bit like his father's mind had gone, where the same stories started to repeat, and then he st words were slipping out every day and many times a day. And when he died with severe dementia, I realized that I'd never heard of any way of preventing that. I want to talk about those things today. It's a new world. We now know more about all of this than we'd known before, and we have tools not only to show us what's going on, but to, to take this power into our hands and to share it and to change this world for ourselves and our loved ones, and that's what I want to talk about today. First, a little bit of bad news. Uh, this is diabetes. It is not your imagination. It is getting a lot worse. And people come into my office and they say, I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. I'm not eating any bread. Because what they're thinking is, diabetes means I've got too much sugar in my blood. Uh, sugar is glucose, and it comes from carbohydrate. So the idea is don't eat any bread, don't eat any potatoes, don't eat sweet potatoes, don't eat cookies, don't eat cakes, don't eat rice, because those are carbohydrates. Well, if you look around the world a little bit, Jerry and I were talking about this earlier, take a look at Japan. In Japan, you have the skinniest people, the longest lived people on the planet. What's the dietary staple of Japan? Huge amounts of rice uh, for breakfast, lunch, dinner. And if you look at diabetes in Japan, in adults over the age of 40, before 1980, diabetes was rare, 1 to 5% of the population. But what happened in Japan right around 1980? Anybody know? As William Castelli at the Framingham Heart Study always said, when you see the golden arches, you could be on the road to the pearly gates. And <laughs> this is not traditional Japanese food, but it's become very popular. And if you look at the, can you see that? The fat content of the diet is, it's not as bad as ours, but it's going up. And carbohydrate is going down. They're eating less rice year by year. And by 1990, diabetes was 11 to 12%. This shows us two things. The first thing is diabetes is not caused by eating rice. In a little while, I'll tell you what it is caused by. The second thing is diabetes is not genetic. Not for the most part. There are genes for type 1 diabetes and for type 2 diabetes. But did genes change during that time? No, they didn't. There are two kinds of genes. There are dictator genes. Those are the genes that say blue eyes. You're going to have blue eyes. They give orders, you obey. The genes for diabetes are more like committees. They make suggestions. You could get diabetes, but maybe you couldn't. Okay? All right. So let's take a lesson from the United States. We do not have a rice-based diet. We have a meat-based diet. And in 1909, the Department of Agriculture started tracking what we eat. And meat intake rose, especially in the post-World War II period, and hit an all-time high in 2004. 
And what was the big increase? Pork? Beef? Chicken. Americans eat a million chickens per hour. <laughs> Let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Back in 1909, when the government started tracking, cheese was a European thing. We don't eat cheese in North Dakota. But in the 60s and 70s and 80s, fast food chains, and especially pizza chains, brought cheese into our lives. You know, pizza is a delivery vehicle for cheese. And as of 2012, your average American was eating 30 pounds more than we were a century earlier. That would be okay, except it's 70% fat. Mostly saturated fat, that's bad fat. It's got a lot of cholesterol, it's got a lot of sodium. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. And we're eating huge amounts of this stuff, enormous quantities. Um, sugar, when Americans were gaining weight in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, what we saw was different kinds of sugar were moving in different directions. The blue line is table sugar. The green line, high fructose corn syrup, Put it all together, you get the red line, we're eating more sugar. Okay, so more meat, more cheese, more sugar. Why do we have an obesity epidemic? I don't know. We're not exercising enough, right? No, that has nothing to do with it. It's all on the input side of the equation. And the reason this is important is if we're wagging a finger at our kids saying, you just need to stop reading, just get off your, your iPad and start exercising, you cannot exercise that off. Exercise is great, but the reason for obesity and the reason for the diabetes epidemic and other things I'm going to talk to you about is because we are eating in a way that human beings never ate in the history of this planet. Now, here's diabetes from 20 years ago, 1994. There is North Dakota right up there. Less than 4% of the population had diabetes. Here we are in disgrace in Louisiana and Mississippi, more than 6%. But as our diet was changing, the map started changing. Here's 95 and 96 and 97 and 98 and 99, 2000, 2001. Diabetes doesn't wait. If you change your diet, it comes roaring in. Now, I'm going to change the color scheme to, because I want to zero in on certain counties. Um, but the map is getting worse. And Colorado, better than everybody. But even in Colorado, things are starting to get worse. Okay, so who does better? Researchers for a long time have studied Seventh-day Adventists. And when I started my research career, I couldn't figure out why are you putting Adventists under the microscope? Well, I soon learned that Seventh-day Adventists, by their teachings, are supposed to avoid tobacco and alcohol and caffeine and meat. And almost all Adventists are good at the first three. But some eat meat, some don't. They're, they're non-smokers, non-drinkers. And in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data. What they were looking at was BMI. Are you familiar with BMI? Yeah. B body Mass Index. It's, it's your weight, but it's adjusted for how tall you are. And ideally, below 25. They looked at not quite 61,000 people, and they separated them based on the diet that they habitually followed. And the red bar on the left is what they called non-vegetarians or, or meat-eaters. And they, they were not below 25, they were at about 28.8. And the next group was semi-vegetarians, meat less than once a week, a little skinnier. The third group, pesco-vegetarians, pesco meaning? Okay, no meat except fish, a little thinner. Then lacto-ovo-vegetarians, lacto meaning? Okay, dairy products, ovo, eggs, okay. No meat, but dairy and eggs. And what's that blue line out on the right? I, I have to tell my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. Um, <laughs> but this is a person who doesn't consume animal products at all. And that's the only group that is smack in the middle of the healthy weight range. But, but this is not why the American Diabetes Association published these data. They were looking at diabetes. And you see the same gradient. The meat eaters have a lot. The vegans have almost none. So that's very impressive. So, my research team thought, okay, let's test that diet. Let's bring in people who had never thought about doing anything like this before, and let's see what happens. So we brought in a group of people who were all, it was postmenopausal women with moderate to severe weight problems. And we did not say to reduce calories or avoid carbs. What we said was no animal products and keep oils low. 
So don't take that bottle of olive oil and go glug, 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 glug all over your pasta. It's going to be low-fat foods. Uh, we asked them not to change their exercise, and it was a 14-week study. So what we asked them to eat from was what we call the power plate. Fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. Legumes are... Okay, uh, beans, peas, lentils, foods that grow in a pod. So uh, breakfast might be blueberry pancakes or oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins or uh, chili with not meat but with vegetables or beans. And if my linguine arrives, uh, instead of an Alfredo sauce, it might have artichokes and seared oyster mushrooms. This is not a punishing diet. Uh, no calorie counting, no carb counting. And at 14 weeks, the average person had lost 13 pounds. Uh, their wa waist dropped by two inches, and their insulin sensitivity uh, improved, which we measure with glucose tolerance testing. So predicated on these results, which we published in the American Journal of Medicine, uh, NIH, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, we tracked them for two more years. And we compared them to a control group following a chicken and fish diet. The control group is the red line. Over the long run, they didn't do so well. The blue line was the vegan group. And because you're not starving, there's no reason to overeat. There's no reason for the weight to come back. And you just, it's a one-way street to a healthier waistline. OK, so the National Institutes of Health then gave us a grant and said, why don't you test this for type 2 diabetes? So we used a plant-based diet and compared it to a conventional carb-counting, calorie-restricted, conventional diabetes diet. 22-week uh, study, so about five months and a year follow-up. We had 99 people, and what we track is something called hemoglobin A1C. If you have diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it, it, and what, what A1C is, if I test your blood glucose, it's going up and down minute by minute, but A1C stays pretty stable. And it should be below seven if you have diabetes. So the red line was the conventional diet. They had a nice drop down to 7.5. The people on the vegan diet, no calorie counting, no carb limits at all. They were free to eat as much as they wanted. Had this massive drop, just on average, of more than 1.2 absolute percentage points on A1C, which is not only better than any other diet that's ever been tested, but better than any oral diabetes medication that we had available too. And when we saw these results, um, there, there were some unusual things that happened. This is Vance. Vance had been a policeman in Washington. His father was dead by age 30. Vance was diagnosed with diabetes at 31, came in to see us in his late 30s, and he was randomly assigned to the vegan group. And after about three weeks, he said, this is the easiest diet I ever did. You don't tell me to count anything. You don't tell me to not eat stuff. I can eat as much as I want. I just got to learn different kinds of foods. But he said it was easy. Lost about 60 pounds over the course of a year. His diabetes medications were discontinued. And his hemoglobin A1C was not below 7 to start. It was 9.5, which is terrible. It dropped to 5.3, which is normal. Here's what this When I was in medical school, I was taught you can't get normal. Here was a man in front of me, and his lab test showed that on no medication at all, he had a hemoglobin A1C of a teenager. The diabetes was no longer, do, do I tell him? I, I, I had to say, I thought about this for a long period of time. Could I tell him he didn't have diabetes anymore? I have to say, as, this, as we've started to see many, many cases of this, we're quite comfortable telling people that their diabetes is, is gone. Um, that does not mean it could not come back. It's waiting around the corner. If Velveeta comes back into your life, Diabetes will find you. This is, oh, by the way, I, I was asking his permission to share his experience. He said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away, too. Um, you can write that down. Um, th this is Nancy. Uh, same story. She lost about 40 pounds. She stopped her diabetes medications. Her A1C improved. It's still in the diabetic range, but much, much better. And her arthritis improved dramatically. Uh, it, it effectively went away. And uh, that's another talk. But uh, bottom line, when you're not eating dairy products and dairy protein, the inflammatory processes that are attacking the joints in many cases goes away. And there are, there are other parts of the diet that can cause inflammation too. But this is a biggie, okay? Um, 
All right, now I want to, this is my most important slide. Um, if there are any medical people, I want you to t turn on your phone and take a picture of this. Um, this is a muscle cell. The reason I'm showing you a muscle cell is that's where sugar is going. Some sugar in your blood goes to your brain. Some goes to your liver. Some goes to other parts, but most of it goes to your muscles because it's, it's powering your, your movements. And so there's the glucose. To get into that cell, it needs a hormone, which is called insulin. And there it is. Insulin is like a key. So here's the insulin. It, it attaches to that red receptor just like a key in a lock. And once the insulin attaches, it signals those channels to bring in the glucose, and there it is, coming right in. That's what's supposed to happen. But there's, there's a problem here. This is a, when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, I lived in a part of town where some other kids would play this not very nice trick. When nobody was home, they would put chewing gum in your front door lock. And you get home with a perfectly good key that will not open your door anymore. I hope you never lived in a neighborhood like that. So rather than climb in and out your window all you know, for the rest of your life, you clean the door up door lock out, and your key will work again. You don't have chewing gum in your cells. What you have is fat. Chicken fat, cheese fat, beef fat, fryer grease, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, extra extra virgin olive oil. There might be a little 1040 motor oil in there for all I know. <laughs> anyway, this fat builds up inside the cell, and it stops the insulin key from working. Are you with me? The buildup of fat causes insulin resistance. Now, now, doctors hate words like fat. It's got one syllable, so we are going to call it intramyocellular lipid. It's, this is fat inside the cell. So why did Vance's diabetes go away? Well, think about it. How much fat is there in a low-fat vegan diet? How much animal fat is there? There isn't any. And if I keep the oils low, do you think that fat is going to stay there? It gradually dissipates, the insulin can work again, and so time goes backwards. The cause of his diabetes is starting to go away. And not just for, for Vance, but for anybody with type 2 diabetes. And it, by the way, this is not belly fat. You can be skinny. This is fat inside the cell that I can only detect with MR spectroscopy. It's inside the cell, okay? And now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. This is GEICO. Uh, when I look out my office window, uh, GEICO's national headquarters is about three blocks away. And back in 2006, the he head of the health service at GEICO said, we need you here. We've got 2,500 employees here. We're, we're self-insured. You wouldn't believe what we're paying for Lipitor, for insulin, for blood pressure pills. Why don't we do your diet at GEICO? And I said, let's do it, but let's do it as a test. So we picked two different GEICO facilities, this one in the Washington area and one in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And at this one, they got a program of introducing a healthy diet at work, and at the other one, they didn't, and we tracked everyone's weight and health. And the idea was that they would once a week get a discussion group at, at lunchtime on how to begin a vegan diet, if anybody wanted to do it, totally voluntary. And the other thing was that they would get vegan food served in the cafeteria, but this was totally new to the cafeteria manager. Um, um, it, anyway, but they, they figured it out. It took a little while, and the people in Fredericksburg didn't lose any weight, but the people in the Washington area, they lost weight very nicely. And so then Geico said, well, that was pretty good. Let's do it in Georgia. Let's do it in San Diego. Let's do it in, we did it in 10 different cities, and exactly the same thing happened. If you, if you had weight to lose, you lost weight. If you had diabetes, you got better. And by now, we just see this all the time. And my, I have to say, my instructors who were teaching in all these cities were really, really happy because instead of thinking people are resistant, people love it. It's, it's a fun, cool thing that you can do at work, um, except, except there were two participants that my instructors kept complaining about. These were in the Washington area. And every week the instructors would come back and say, Hillary and Bruce, 
I don't know why they even show up because they sit in the back of the room and they chatter and talk and they, they're paying no attention to what anybody else is saying and they're just distracting everybody. I wish they wouldn't come. And every week I kept hearing about how bad Hillary and Bruce are. And I, I want to tell you something. You can misjudge people. They were distracting, but what they were actually talking about was the foods they were going to pick up at the store on the way home, how they would convince her father to go vegan with them, how they would have a vegan Thanksgiving for all their friends, and a year later they sent me this picture. Um, <laughs> Hillary's lost 85 pounds, Bruce has lost 100 pounds, um, and the other thing about this, if you have been beaten up by a diet, and by beaten up by a diet, I mean you thought it was going to work, and it was hard for you and somehow you're not getting the results that other people were getting. That's not just bad for you physically. That's bad for you psychologically because it teaches you there's something wrong with you. And I want to tell you something. There is nothing wrong with you. There is a lot wrong with diets that are based on starvation or telling you you can't eat healthy complex carbs and things like that. And there's a lot of goofy diets out there. But a diet based on healthy vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans is the fuel your body works on. And that allows you to succeed automatically. And that heals you f physically. But it also allows you to repair some of the damage that happens to us in years of commercial diet goofy nonsense that we've had to live with, okay? All right, so this is a man named Jean Remy. He lived in Canada, uh, sent me these pictures because he was at 320 pounds. His doctor said, you've got prediabetes. And his wife heard about the program that we were doing, gave him a book. By the time he got to chapter four, he'd lost 160 pounds. And like Hillary and Bruce, he discovered he, li he liked exercising now. He got energy. Uh, this is Gina, same story. She, needed to lose not as much weight, but wanted to lose it not by starving, but just making qualitative shifts. She gets her waistline back and her health back, and, and, and this is what works. Okay, at the same time as we were doing this work on diabetes, some researchers elsewhere started to discover a parallel track that led to the health of the brain. And if, you, if it's all right with you, I'd like to pursue that a little bit. First of all, the bad news, Alzheimer's is getting much more common. This is not just because the baby boomers are aging, that's part of it. The disease is more common, not just here, but in other countries. And it starts out as a lapse. What was the name of that movie? <laughs> if this happens once in a while, that's normal. That's sleep deprivation. But if it's every day, it's mild cognitive impairment. Um, and if you're having trouble learning and remembering and reasoning and visual spatial ability, you, you, you can't get a map straight anymore. Uh, language and personality start to go. This is what starts to lead us down to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Now you're gonna say, I don't want that. That is like the last disease that I want to even think about getting. Because when you get Alzheimer's, you lose everything. Everything. Your doctor will say to you, I'm sorry. It's genetic. There, there's a gene. It's called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. If you got it from one parent, you've got three times the risk. If both parents gave it to you, you've got 10 to 15 times the risk. Get new parents. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, let, let me show you how the brain, what's going on in the brain. This red crescent, that's the hippocampus. That's Latin for seahorse. This will be on the test. The, the, the hippoca some anatomist 2,000 years ago thought that looked like a seahorse. Anyway, it's the hippocampus. The, the hippocampus has the job of deciding what's worth remembering. So the waiter comes up to your restaurant table and says, hi, my name is Kelly. I'll be your waiter tonight. And the hippocampus goes, I don't think so. Um, but things that need to be remembered, um, go up to the cerebral hemispheres, and you don't get a new cell for every new fact. What you get is new connections and stronger connections between cells. But if you look into the cerebral hemispheres, you discover that these cells, these normal brain cells, are squishing out protein strands. And these protein strands will get into sort of balls of yarn, or little meatballs that we call beta amyloid plaques. And that doesn't look so good. It's sort of like one of those old-fashioned sausage makers cranking out the strands of, of protein and then they collect in these meatballs in the brain. It's a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Well, anybody know what this is? 
That is Chicago. 1993, the Chicago Health and Aging Project got started. And what they did is they interviewed thousands of people. All they asked them is, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? What did you have for dinner? And they then carefully tracked those people over years and to, to see if there was anything that linked to brain health. And the first thing that they keyed in on was something I knew about. When I was a kid growing up in Fargo, my mother had, she had five kids, and bacon would waft its smell up to our bedroom, and we'd all run downstairs, and my mother was taking the bacon strips out of the frying pan and putting them on a paper towel to cool down. And when the pan had no more bacon in it, it she had that bacon hot grease in the pan, and you don't want to throw that away, that's good bacon grease. So she would carefully pour it into a jar to save it. Did your mom do this? That jar did not go in the refrigerator. It just went on the shelf because she knew that when bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It solidifies, and that is a sign that it's really high in saturated fat, bad fat. And the number one source of saturated fat is dairy products, but it's also in meat, okay? So in Chicago, some people don't eat very much of it, and some people eat a lot of it, and we're going to separate those two groups. So the researchers tried to compare the low saturated fat group to the high saturated fat group, and I should want to show you the numbers. That's the low group, that's the high group. So the people who are eating the most saturated fat, most dairy, most bacon, had three and a half times the risk of Alzheimer's compared to the other people. Um, where is it coming from? Two eggs, three grams of saturated fat, one strip of bacon, another gram. Do you know anyone who has one strip of bacon? Uh, chicken thigh, even without the skin, four and a half grams. Glass of whole milk, another four and a half grams. Pizza for one, 12 grams. Do you know people who eat these foods? People are eating these foods everywhere. And you just add that up and you're automatically in the high risk group. Okay. Uh, Researchers in Finland said, what if we don't look at Alzheimer's? What if we just look at mild cognitive impairment, that, that situation where you're having a lot of mental lapses later in life, but you don't have Alzheimer's, you're still driving, you're still managing. Um, they took a little bit more than 1,000 adults, they tracked their diet at age 50, and then they watched them for the next 21 years. And some of them ate relatively little saturated fat, some ate more, and it wasn't just Alzheimer's. Exactly the same thing with the mental lapses that hit us as we're older. The fattier your diet, the more likely you are to have brain problems. Um, well, what about that gene? That ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. Well, they, they redid the data looking only at those people. And here we are, some people had relatively low fat, some high fat, and here's the numbers. Just so that you understand, these are all people at genetic risk. But if you avoided the bad fats, your risk of developing these memory problems was cut by 80%. Genes are not destiny. Just like in the case of diabetes. The genes for Alzheimer's disease are a committee that's making a real strong suggestion. And now is the time to say, I don't think so. I don't want that disease. The, the, the solution to it is not a perfect one. But we have tools that we didn't used to have. Oh yeah, what's that now? There's a fat in uh, donuts. Anybody know what that's called? Trans? Trans fats, that's right. Uh, some people in Chicago know what a donut is. Some people avoid it, some people eat a lot of it, and I wanna show you the numbers. Exactly the same, okay. So, what, all we're doing is we're adding up the tools. If I'm avoiding the, the, the saturated fat, if I'm avoiding the trans fats, I've cut my risk dramatically. Are you with me? Okay, now we're just getting started. But why would this be? Researchers at Kaiser Permanente said maybe it's cholesterol. Bad fats raise cholesterol. So they brought in 10,000, not quite 10,000 people, and some of them had a lower cholesterol, a little higher, a little higher, and a little higher cholesterol. And then they looked at their likelihood of getting Alzheimer's. The higher you up here, that's the more Alzheimer's. You see the obvious pattern. If you have a low cholesterol level, your Alzheimer's risk is relatively low. If you maintain a high cholesterol, your Alzheimer's risk is high. But these cholesterol tests were done when they were 40 years of age, dictating their Alzheimer's risk three decades later. Never too early to, to change, okay? 
So what else is lurk, lurk, lurking in those plaques? There's the protein, there's cholesterol, there also are iron and copper. I don't know if that surprises you. Uh, if your cast iron pan rusted, if your copper penny oxidizes, well, the same thing happens to iron and copper in your body. We eat iron in meat and a number of foods. Copper is in many foods. It oxidizes in your body. As it oxidizes, it releases free radicals. You know about free radicals. These are the sparks that are attacking your skin and they're attacking your brain. They're destroying the connections between cells. So cast iron pans, copper pipes, meat, liver, probably the worst of all. Uh, multiple vitamins. The vitamins are fine, but they put iron and copper in that you don't need. Now this one, Cetrib Silver says, we know it. You, you don't need iron anymore. You're getting plenty from foods. They'll take it out, but they're still loading you up with copper. They're 20 years behind the science. You should be taking a vitamin B12 supplement. That's good. But if you're taking a multiple vitamin, get one that's called vitamins only. No, without the iron and without the copper, you don't need it. You're getting those from foods, OK? Um, all right. So I've been saying, get away from the animal products. Eat the healthy, natural foods. It sounds kind of like a Mediterranean diet, and, and, and it is. And in fact, if you look at Mediterranean regions, those people who have a glass or two of wine every day have less Alzheimer's than other people. And it's true. In fact, when I was in college, I think some of my roommates felt that they were on the Mediterranean program. <laughs> um, they were doing their best to follow a good, healthy Mediterranean diet. Um, but some researchers said, well, maybe it's not the alcohol that's doing that. Maybe it's the grape. So at the University of Cincinnati, researchers brought in a group of people They had mild cognitive impairment, average age 78, and what they tested was just grape juice. A uh, pint a day, which is a lot, but what they discovered was that in three months, their learning was better and their recall was better. Why? I mean, that's too easy. Three months? Um, how, well, think about it. A grape has a rough life. It's sitting on the vine all day under the sun with no protection. Or wait a minute, that purple color, th that's, those are anthocyanins. They are powerful antioxidants, they protect the grape. Well, if that's it, maybe other foods that have that same kind of color will do it. Back to the lab, let's try blueberry juice. And so we brought in a new group of people, gave them a pint a day of blueberry juice, exactly the same benefit. Okay, now I'm not suggesting that you need to have blueberry juice or, or grape juice. What I am suggesting is that, oops, sorry. Um, what I am suggesting is that those colors aren't just there to be pretty. If you go to the produce aisle of a grocery store, the orange color of carrots or sweet potatoes, you can see that at 100 yards. The red lycopene that's in a tomato you can see that across the room. The, the dark purple anthocyanins in blueberries and in grapes and many other foods, you could see that a long ways away. But if your cat came with you, your cat would say, I don't see what you're, you're so excited about. Your cat doesn't have your color or vision. Your cat is a carnivore and is looking for motion in the distance. Cats and dogs have a very acute sense of hearing and of smell, and they're ac acutely attuned to motion. But the human retina has evolved over time to recognize antioxidants, and the human brain has created a positive valence that says, I want that. Now we take those colors and we put them in an M&M's bag. <laughs> but the original function is to save your life. Is this making sense? Okay, all right. So, food isn't everything. Exercise is important too. And at the University of Illinois, researchers did an interesting thing. They brought in 120 adults, and they asked them to take a brisk walk three times a week. And it reversed brain shrinkage, especially in the hippocampus, which is Latin for seahorse. Who's had her asparagus today? That's very good. Um, and it improved their memory. So exercise is good. It gets the oxygen going in the brain, gets the waste products out. So I have my own exercise tips that I would like to share with you. Um, arrive at the airport as late as possible. <laughs> um, carry massively heavy luggage. Run for the plane. Um, I do this about two or three times every week. Um, but what they did at the University of Illinois was a little different. They just said, 10-minute walk. Three times a week. 
Not a trudge, this is a brisk walk. Uh, then add five minutes every week, so it's 15, 15, 15, then the next week 20, 20, 20. Once you get up to 40 minutes, three times a week, brisk walk, that is the level that reversed brain shrinkage, okay? Imagine what happens if you get the saturated fat out, the trans fats out, the excess metals out, and you're pumping up your brain. Are you getting power? Absolutely. We're just getting started. Um, it's not just physical exercise, it's mental exercise, and you know this already. It started in Canada. Some people in Canada speak one language. Some people speak two. The people who speak two languages have a delay of cognitive decline by about five years compared to other people. If you speak three languages, even better. Um, your, your high school French will not help you. <laughs> you have to be using it today. If you're using it, it will help you, okay? So intellectual activities, documentaries, newspapers, these are all good for you. This is the one I read. Uh, pick out the one that, that's meaning, most meaningful to you. But anything that gets the, the word machinery working is good for you, okay? Crosswords, an anagrams are especially good. Um, I was sitting in a lecture by Dean Ornish. You know Dean Ornish? He's a medical genius. He showed that you can reverse heart disease with a plant-based diet and a healthy lifestyle. And he, he, I was sitting in a lecture and he showed this slide. He said, if I focus just on myself, if I focus on I, I will be ill. But if I focus on we, if I get the support of a group, I can be well. And he was making a really good point, get, get group support. But while he was making that point, I was thinking about something completely different, which was, isn't that cool that there's these words hidden in other words, and that's probably good for your brain to see that. So I started taking words like this, and if you rearrange them, it's amazing what you can kind of come up with, and as you do this, this is helping your gray matter improve, this is helping your white matter get better, <laughs> and if you do this daily, you're going to see a lot of improvement in your brain. Okay, so now there are some uh, companies that are making money doing this. You've heard about Lumosity.com. Oh, hi, David, I remember what you ordered last time you were at my restaurant and you get a tip, or how many words begin with D-I-G. They're working on memory and reaction time and reasoning five minutes a day. There, I'm, I'm not pushing Lumosity, there are many others, but the idea is that these resources are out there for you, okay? Now, the most important thing, whether it's physical exercise or intellectual exercise, the most important thing is to stop. You must stop. You have to go to sleep. Because the first part of the night when you're asleep, your brain is engaged in what's called slow wave sleep. It's integrating words and facts and experiences. It's like all of the memories and things that, that, that came in during the day are, are a jumble of file folders. You've got to stop so they can be filed away. The second half of the night is REM sleep, rapid eye movement. Your brain is sorting out physical skills, like a musical instrument or riding a bike or playing tennis, and emotions in dream. If you're up all night, and if you're night after night just not sleeping well, your memory will be poor and your emotional control will be poor. So there's a physiological substrate. At night, your amyloid, that, that sausage maker, turns off. It stops cranking out so much amyloid protein. But that only turns off if you go to sleep, okay? So this is my most important medical device. I don't care how good your book is, 10 o'clock, close it, turn off the light, go to sleep. If you're having problems sleeping, I have a regimen that I use for people that's very, very easy to do, and it's in my book, Power Foods for the Brain, or we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, it's a very easy thing to do. All right, um, so what's a healthy diet? Fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. Those should be our staples. And we, the, we the Physicians Committee, uh, are some of you members of the Physicians Committee for, for Responsible Medicine? Thank you if you are. Um, if you're not, uh, please do join us. We're, we're trying to promote a, a healthier world in many ways, and, um, and I'd love for you to hear about what we're doing. But back in 2009, we sent this to the U.S. government and said, the pyramid is a nice shape, but people eat off a plate. <laughs> Give them a plate. And you don't need a meat group and a dairy group. These are the foods to emphasize. Well, we didn't hear back from them. <laughs> so in 2011, we filed a lawsuit against the USDA. 
And we did hear back from them, and I don't know if you've seen, but this is what the USDA now calls my plate. And they said, okay, fruits, grains, protein, they, Protein could be meat, but it could be beans or tofu or nuts. For the first time in American history, there is no meat group anymore. Uh, the dairy group now includes soy milk. It's not perfect, but we're going in the right direction. I'm not taking any credit for this change. It, it's, it could be a coincidence, but, um, <laughs> but we, we're, making, we're, we're, we're making progress. Okay, so by now you might be thinking, all right, Dr. Barnard, I get it. If I followed your diet, I'd probably be healthier, but my family would divorce me. I'd have to live in the garage. All the pleasures of life will be gone. How am I going to do this? Well, I want to show you how we do this in research studies. We've done this with hundreds of people, and I have never seen anyone unable to do it. I want to walk you through it. Two steps. Step one, check out the possibilities. For the first week, we're not going to eliminate any foods. All we are going to do is try to identify plant-based foods that we genuinely really like. So you take a sheet of paper and you mark breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. And you go to the store or try different recipes and you just see what fits in. Okay, uh, oatmeal, tastes like wallpaper paste. Uh, I gotta put some raisins on it and some cinnamon and now it's good. Um, blueberry pancakes, that'll work. I've never tasted almond milk, but I'll put it on my bran flakes and see what I think. So all I'm doing is I'm just testing out different things. And for lunch, I'll try the veggie pizza without cheese. And I'll try a veggie hot dog or a mandarin stir fry, whatever it is. I'm just trying them out. And I'm going to an Italian restaurant where I'll check out the salads and the pasta fagiole or the angel hair pasta with an arrabbiata sauce. Or uh, Mexican, I'll try the veggie fajitas or bean burritos. Um, at Chinese, I might try the rice and tofu and vegetable dishes. Extra points for Japanese because it's often delicate and very low in oil. So all I'm doing is trying out the plant-based uh, options. And if I happen to go to a submarine sandwich place, would they be willing to make it without meat and cheese? Sure. So you load it up with the lettuce and tomato and onions and cucumbers and olives and red wine vinegar and they'll toast it for you. And, Taco Bell may not be the pinnacle of culinary art, but they'll make you a bean burrito. So that's where you're eating, you're trying out these options. So whatever you're eating from, the whole idea is to just look for your breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack that works for you. And then once you've found them, then step two is to mark out just 21 days, not 22, not 28, just 21, on your calendar and do it all vegan all the time for three weeks just as a test. I can do that, okay, easy. At the end of that time, two things will have happened. The first is you're healthier. You're, you're, physically, you are healthier. Uh, your blood sugar is coming down, you're losing weight, your digestion has finally sorted itself out. But the other thing is your tastes are starting to change in ways you didn't expect. And if that sounds strange, let me ask this group, how many of you ever switched from whole milk to non-fat milk or skim milk? Can I see hands? How, how many? Oh, okay, when you did, what was the skim milk like at the beginning? Watery? It's kind of blue, too. It doesn't look right. Um, how many of you got used to that? Did, how many got used to the lighter taste? Did you ever go back and taste whole milk again? What was that like? Too thick? Kind of like cream? Like, wait a minute. For your whole life, it was fine. But what, if you're not tasting it, for about a three-week period, your taste buds physically change and they prefer the lighter taste. So if you start a low-fat plant-based diet, for the first week it will seem light. You're going to think to yourself, do I have to acquire a taste for folk music now? <laughs> Break out the tie-dye, I'm doing a vegan diet. Oh well, the second week it starts to make sense. And by the third week you've heard that Serena Williams is doing this, and Bill Clinton, I think, and Ellen DeGeneres, and I think Al Gore started doing it, and the, a lot of people are doing this, and there are like 10,000 books, and there are a million websites and DVDs and programs, and a lot of fun products at the store, so it becomes cool, and you discover that all of your friends have adopted you as the nutrition authority. And after about four weeks, if you go back and you have a double bacon cheeseburger, what you discover, it's not the joyful experience that you remembered. But it's simply, it's like being a smoker. If you smoke every other day, you never forget it. But if you've gone without for about three weeks, you got power. 
So that's why we do it this way. If you want transition foods, like the veggie burger instead of the meat burger, or instead of Jimmy Dean, there's Gimme Lean, you, you can do this if you want. So uh, I'm not pushing them, but the meat substitutes are there. We have a free uh, online program called the Kickstart. It's 21 days of menus and recipes and cooking videos. So on day one, Alicia Silverstone will send you her menus and recipes. I'm, I'm not making this up. And a lot of other Hollywood celebrities and athletes will do the same. We've got an app that's also free, 21 Day Kickstart. It's all here at pcrm.org. Please sign up. Uh, by the way, uh, for those of you who are caregivers, we have it in English, Spanish, Mandarin, and a program for people from the Indian subcontinent. We've had about 450,000 people have used this program, all totally free, no commercial bias whatsoever. Um, and is the world changing? I showed you that meat intake hit an all-time high in 2004, but around 2005, 6, 7, it started to sputter. In 2008, it fell. 2009, it fell. 2010, 2011, it started to fall. And if you do the math, by about 2012, we had dropped about 20 pounds of meat per person per year. If you're an animal person, every 1% drop is 100 million animals who weren't eaten. If you're an environmental person, that's that much feed grain that didn't have to be irrigated. And if you're a cardiologist, that's a whole lot of Lipitor you're not using. Um, so we're not where we need to be, but it is also not your imagination. The world is changing. Things are going in a much better direction. However, I want to tell you something, and this is where I'd like to, I'd like to focus your attention on, on something where we're facing a serious challenge. Um, do you remember this? There are a lot of people who are profiting from things that aren't so healthy, and they can say things that sound good in a soundbite, but may not be entirely true. Eat butter, butter's okay. Uh, the dairy management, the beef industry, the Atkins, there are a lot of people who are spending a lot of time trying to convince you to eat their product. And their secret weapon is research. Because if I can do a study that says 20% of adolescent girls are low in iron, then I can press release this, and every TV station on the 6 o'clock news will say, a new study shows that women tend to be low in iron, therefore doctors recommend more red meat. Or I could do another study showing that people are low in calcium, so therefore we need cheese and sour cream and milk and dairy products. Industry uses this. They are not fools. This is the Cattlemen's Beef Board. Look at their research budget, $6.7 million per year. Some of that's marketing. A lot of that is things to get on the evening news. They want your kids and your grandkids to buy their products. Now, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, did you see this earlier this year? This is a group picked by the federal government to decide what Americans should eat. And they put out a report that said there's available evidence that shows no relationship between the consumption of dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. Cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. In other words, we can finally go back and have what we have been craving, which is this egg. And this is apparently the most important thing in our lives. And we can stuff it down our gullet. In fact, if cholesterol doesn't matter, why stop there? We can have sausage again. And this is what Americans over the last several months have started to think. A Gallup poll earlier this, uh, last month showed that Americans are less worried about food than they ever were. And not just this, we can eat salt, we can eat sugar, we can eat all this stuff, who cares? Well, I took a look at a research study that happened to be published by one of the members, Alice Lichtenstein, who's a good researcher uh, at Tufts University. She published a study looking uh, th that I believe they relied on. And they showed that dietary cholesterol has really only a very modest effect on your blood cholesterol. So in other words, are you with me? If you're eating a lot of eggs and other high cholesterol foods, according to this study, it's not really doing much to the cholesterol in your blood. So don't worry about it. Well, that's the headline, but killjoy that I am, I got a hold of this study. And it, it was a, an, a review of 12 prior studies, and here they are. This won't be on the test. Don't try to read this, but there's 12 of them. These are the sponsors. Can you see that? 11 of the 12 are industry, 10 are the egg industry, and one is fisheries. That's prawns they're worried about. Now, skip with the interventions. But what I put here, I put you 
if they found an unfavorable effect of the eggs on your cholesterol level. I put F if it had a favorable effect. And in some cases, for statisticians, it was statistically significant, in others less so. But do you see the pattern? In virtually every single study, if you're feeding eggs or eating shrimp or whatever, your blood cholesterol does go up. It goes up a little bit or it goes up a lot. And that's what people weren't seeing. 92% um, of cholesterol studies are funded by industry. This was not the case back in the 50s and 60s. What has happened? What has happened is that by 1990, 1995, it was clear cut. Cholesterol in foods, about half of it is absorbed into your blood. It makes your blood cholesterol rise. End of story. The federal government stopped doing research on it. It's like they stopped doing studies to see if smoking causes lung cancer. It just does. Stop studying it. The only people who fund research now are the egg industry who are, and, and to some extent the shrimp industry to try to make a case that it doesn't matter. And if I bring in relatively small groups of participants, I can get results that aren't statistically significant. I can say it could be just chance. And they do a lot of these studies. They say it's just a chance finding. It's not significant. And then they send these to good researchers to say it's just small. It doesn't matter. You can forget about it. This is a lie. Okay? So, there are five, are you with me? Is this making sense? Yes. There are five steps for winning this battle. The first is you have to use research strategically. And I mean good, solid, well-conducted, honest research. Secondly, you need to bring nutrition into medical education and care. You shouldn't be able to walk out of your doctor's office without the doctor saying, are you smoking? And tell me about what you're eating. The doctor doesn't have to give you an hour nutrition lecture, but the doctor has to know where to refer you to and to give you those resources. And if the doctor doesn't, they're not doing their job. Uh, it, needs to, uh, it needs to involve the insurers so that they're in the game, and it needs to involve schools, and it needs to involve businesses. So we did this at GEICO, but there isn't any reason that every business can't say, you know, if we can cut our health care costs, we're going to be more competitive. My cars in Detroit can compete with cars in Japan if I'm not spending $2,000 per car on Viagra, number one, Lipitor, blood pressure medicines, diabetes medicines. All of those are related to diet, okay? Uh, every business in America could say, lunchtime, you can have a class on Wednesdays. Now, this is a little bit bigger. This is one of our classes, a little bit bigger than we like. But you can do this. We did it at Geico. We've done it at the power company in, in Washington. We've done it all kinds of places. Once you bring this stuff into work, you can revolutionize your workplace. Now, when it comes to research studies, I'm going to tell you what we need. We need meta-analyses that pull all the data together because in five years' time, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is meeting again, and that's what they are going to look for. So if the egg industry is buying them, that's what they're going to get. We at the Physicians Committee, this is what we do. And this is what has to be done. You need cl good clinical trials on diabetes, on Alzheimer's disease, on hypertension. And you need exploratory studies. So if rheumatoid arthritis is something that maybe doesn't have to be treated by drugs but can be treated by diet, let's, let's study that and not wait for just another drug trial. That's what we need to do. Now, the last thing that I just want to say is we can get there because we've been here before. A generation ago, I was sitting in a meeting in my hospital, the George Washington University Hospital. We were deciding whether or not we should ban smoking. We sold cigarettes in the gift shop. I bought them. My head of surgery bought them. We would walk down the corridor to the doctor's lounge smoking cigarettes. Our patients smoked in bed. And that, you, you remember the, this time, we decided we we're going to ban smoking, and every other hospital did the same thing, and every restaurant, and every airline, and every government building, and every business said, you can't smoke here. And that became the greatest gift to every smoker who wanted to quit but needed some support. And now it can be a February morning in Washington, D.C. There's some guy shivering in his shirt sleeves outside, finishing his cigarette before he's allowed into his non-smoking building. Well, people are changing their diets, too, but not fast enough. We're just like where we were with smoking. We, we weren't idiots then. We were just taking our time because it takes time to get cancer. I can quit eventually. Well, we made the decision the time is now with cigarettes. A generation fast forward to today, that's where we are with food. 
Now is the time. Because if we don't do anything, our kids are at risk, everyone we love is at risk, and we are at risk. But we can make these changes, and the, the way to do it is to have fun with it. Try new foods, new recipes, new books, new DVDs, new explorations. A new restaurant, try it out. If you have a dud, who cares? We're having fun with this. And then if you find something you like, share it at work, share it with schools, share it with people you love, share it with a letter to the editor, share it with a call to your member of Congress about what foods we subsidize. If we make enough noise, yes, there are industries that profit from this, but there are more doctors, nurses, dietitians, worried parents, worried principals and teachers. Our problem is we're quiet. If we have fun with it, if we explore with it, and if we make some noise, we can revolutionize the health of this country. Thank you very much.